Well, good morning. Welcome to the Ag Now Roundup. My name is Dave Deacon. By the time winter moves into cattle country, most of the grasses in the pastures are dormant and producers have moved to baled hay for feed. Now, with that said, there are still plenty of options for green forage and near the top of that list, you'll find oats. This morning on the Ag Now Roundup, we're learning about oat production from the University of Kentucky's forage system specialist, Dr. Ray Smith. We'll kick off our chat about oats in just a few minutes, but first, let's take a look at the weather across the country with meteorologist Matt Makins. Agnow Weather Time, Matt Makins here. Hope you're doing well. Chatting about oats, well, most of the northern U.S. obviously has some frozen soils, and that's not going to help the drought situation until we get into the spring and thaw out and add some moisture. But we'll chat about moisture first, and then we'll talk about the temperature impact. Is there a burst of cold coming our way without a protective blanket of snow? We'll chat about that in a moment. Precip on the way, and again, with frozen soils across the northern states, this is just going to be runoff. Uh, but it may help out your dugout situation for stock water and things, but not necessarily crop aspect. Water is going to be plentiful out to the west. They're getting inundated in California with steady flow of moisture and also the southern plains. So any oats that may be uh, central or southern plains, this water is going to soak in for you. And we're having a likelihood of well more than an inch from Kansas City southward into these hotter colors that you see around Houston, on up in Louisiana and Arkansas. Those hotter colors would represent around two inches or so of total water. Now these areas have already flooded, so the soil is saturated. We're gonna add to that this is going to be good for surface water, so your dugouts, a stock water situation, and decent for the soil moisture, depending on exactly where you are. Because obviously, if we are flooding, that's not going to be a value, uh, but we got to soak into the soil. So there's still going to be some pockets here with some valuable water. In other cases, too much. But again, for the northern plains, we're frozen. So what's going to fall is, is really going to help your stream flow, your dugouts, that kind of thing, rather than your soils, obviously. Here's a watch as we as we go throughout the week ahead, where that moisture is going to be. Really going to hit California and then a developing storm system by the weekend around Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming. It's going to send moisture into the northern plains and also moisture down to the south. That's going to be the primary storm system of the week ahead. In terms of cold, on the back side of the system, is it really grabbing cold to be of impact, whether you're calving or, or emerged crops, not necessarily a huge impact there. Snow on the way. When you compare that map to the precip map, you can tell there's going to be a lot of rain with this next system. Snow confined to the elevations. There's going to be a lot of it in the Rockies and the Sierras. As you look at the northern plains here, there's parts of North Dakota and South Dakota that could come away with several inches, half foot or so generally speaking. And we'll also catch some snow here into the upper Midwest and out across the east, but not a lot of snowfall. There's not a lot of cold air coming through with this system. So as you look at the outlook beyond this next system, which doesn't have a lot of cold air, let's go behind it. Let's go days later. So we're looking at the 5th of February through the 12th. So following that system, if it doesn't have the cold air with it initially, can it grab any? Not really. Temperature outlook is warmer than average for the northern plains into the central plains. That system, it, it really doesn't have a tap of cold. Yeah, it'll be colder than normal for California due to the precip and the southeastern U.S. But as far as cold, substantial cold coming through with this one, not likely at this time. And what about precip following this system? Where will the focus be? Is it going to be on the plains again? Not necessarily. There's going to be hit and miss moisture for the plains for the 5th through the 12th, but really the focus remains over California. Steady flow of moisture there and will be a little bit drier as you look at the East Coast. So following this weekend system, not necessarily cold, although cooler, but not cold. And then precip wise, we'll see this system exit and relatively quieter for a couple of days. But we'll chat more about that outlook in the next AgNow Weather Outlook. Well, thank you so much, Matt. When the temperatures drop and the fields get frosty, oats step up as a fantastic winter forage for cattle. They're tough enough to brave the cold and still provide top-notch nutrition. 
Plus, there are plenty of benefits to soil when you bring oats into the winter system, reducing erosion and improving soil structure. This makes oats ideal for farmers seeking to maintain cattle health and productivity throughout the winter months. This morning, we're talking with Dr. Ray Smith with the University of Kentucky about oats production. And Dr. Smith, I guess let's just dive in. Tell us about winter oats across the United States. Well, oats are just excellent with their seedling vigor, with their high quality, um, with the fact that when they are becoming mature, they still um, remain much of that quality. Um, so a lot of useful purposes of oats um, for cattle feed, both for grazing and for stored feed. Well, and whenever we usually think of oat production, it's usually in one of two seasons. It's either a fall or a spring season. Is there a benefit to planting one versus the other? Well, I think there are really benefits to both. It kind of depends on your situation. It depends on your climate um, with the amount of production that you might get if with a late summer, early fall planting um, as far as late fall production, winter production, early spring production. Obviously, many areas of the country, you're not going to really have growth through the winter. In certain areas of the country, there's potential for winter kill. So another option, even if that's the case, then is, is planting in the early spring for that spring production. What would be some of the better parts of the country whenever it comes to looking at uh, winter or spring production oats? Yes, yeah, so across much of the South, Mm -hmm. um, up through Tennessee and, and across that way, and, and, and then in the, in the Central Plain states and some of those Southern Central Plain states, um, oats planted in the late summer, early fall, um, even mid fall, um, can provide some quite good late fall, winter production and, and their early spring production. We found in Kentucky that, that winter oats planted in the fall about half the time have some winter injury or winter kill. So it's a bit of a risky proposition. One of the options that we often talk to producers about is planting oats and fall rye in the late summer, early fall, because the fall rye always survives our winters. The oats get started a little bit sooner. So that can be a combination that you know you'll have winter survival, um, but you'll have that good early production from the oats and the oats may survive the winter as well. And there are certain parts of the country where the phrase mudding in oats may be used because they may have had a wetter than planned winter. Are there advantages to those situations where maybe it's just a shorter growing season? Yeah, oats, we've been so impressed with mudding them in or actually drilling them in in mid-March. Um, like you say, maybe in a overgrazed area or even an area that you, sh you just want some short print short-term production. We can see within two months of planting, um, two tons of dry matter per acre. And so since we're planting those for, for short-term production, um, short-term hay production or, or grazing during that period. There could even be grazing happening uh, a month after planting or, or if you're broadcasting into that muddy area uh, a month after um, putting those out. And whenever it comes to those quick forage situations, are there any type of uh management issues whenever it comes to weeds or is it just hey we got forage let's use it let's worry about the weeds later we typically have it worried a lot about weeds um and part of that is the i don't want to say there's not any weed issues but the aggressiveness of oats um they're quite competitive with weeds and and so in our mind some weeds that would be mixed in there as long as those aren't toxic weeds um don't really have a, a major impact and don't have, you don't have nearly the weed problems that you have with the traditional perennial forages um, because they're just not as vigorous as, as seedlings. Well, and across the Great Plains, especially in Oklahoma and Kansas, there's a lot of grazed wheat uh, for winter forage. Would there be any advantages to looking at oats over uh, a winter wheat? So, I mean, an advantage to wheat is the fact that it's pretty well always going to survive the winter with, with a few exceptions, obviously, with really cold weather and, and has good quality grazing. Right. Um, oats tend to be even higher quality, yeah. better seedling vigor at planting. Um, an advantage to oats would be maybe there's winter kill in the wheat and they could be drilled into that area to give that spring production that you were hoping that you would have out of the wheat. Um, and again, the, the quality and the, and the vigor of, of oats. 
um, that the oats provide. We haven't done a lot of direct comparisons. We look at oats in our situation, particularly with the early spring plantings, as more kind of as a emergency forage. You realize that um, you're going to maybe be short of hay or short of spring pasture. It's something that you can put in and get a quick growth. We typically go with the application of nitrogen, but not a real high rate, typically um, 60 pounds of nitrogen um, to, to give that, that good production. If you were going into an area that you've been feeding or extensively grazing, then you'd have a fair bit of nitrogen from the manure in urine. And so you may not need to add that extra nitrogen. You mentioned the benefits of adding nitrogen over the planting of oats. Let's talk about some of the soil benefits of planting oats as a forage and you know overall for the soil quality. So oats have a really vigorous root system because of that vigor with their growth and with their root system. So that's going to that's going to help the soil, just the roots, but also because they come up quickly, you've mm -hmm. got a good soil cover. So that reduces erosion. We already talked about um, kind of suppressing weed growth. So again, I can't I can't rattle off documented statistics about all the soil improvements, but it, it's something that we've seen and, and it's, it's a fairly obvious thing when you see that kind of vigorous growth. So take us through the growing season of the oats from the planting date on. So when, when we're planting oats, like I say, a lot of what we've done is, is spring planting. And we typically are planting in mid-March and we have a, a first cutting, like I mentioned before, often um, two tons or one and a half to two tons drought, drought matter. We can often get a second cutting, or if you were grazing, about a half a ton a, a month later. And then you could plant summer annuals straight into that because the oats are pretty well done at that point in time. Now, many farmers that are using that kind of situation, they would, after that first cutting in the middle of May, um, they, they would use some type of non-selective herbicides to just knock out that regrowth and plant into it with their summer crop, with their corn crop or their soybean crop. Looking at different varieties, we've not tried to measure quality between varieties, but we have seen yield differences between different varieties. So we encourage people to plant improved varieties that you have some test data on your farm. But to be quite honest with you, in using oats as an emergency crop, then if you're having trouble obtaining those improved varieties, then a good quality feed oat, like you might feed your horses, um, still can provide some good cover, um, some, some, some good quality forage there, though not, though not typically the, as much yield as you would get from an improved variety. You know, that's really interesting. It, it's nice to have that feed oat option as kind of a last ditch effort uh, to go ahead and still have a forage out there on the land. Yes, yes. And one of the things that we're often asked in, in the spring of the year is people say, I've got mm -hmm. some leftover winter wheat and I'm just going to plant that for pasture. What do you think? Um, or for, for kind of a, a emergency hay production. And we've tried that a number of times and it, 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 it makes sense on one hand that, oh, that should do well, but winter wheat in many of the cereals, uh, the, the, the winter type cereals need a fertilization period to be able to have that elongated growth and, and that, that yield potential. So we often end up with spring planted winter wheat, maybe a half a ton of production and the oats is, is two tons. So just something to add for when people are thinking about that. Again, most of us realize that winter wheat needs fertilization, but we often don't think about that. Um, this doesn't really make sense in a, in a spring planting to, to use that winter wheat. A spring wheat would work, um, though it would take a bit longer to mature than oats. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ray Smith with the University of Kentucky for going on with us this morning. Hopefully this will help some producers out there with they're in a situation where they need an emergency forage. Great, thanks so much. Well, and of course, thank you for watching this episode of the AgNow Roundup. If there's something on the show that you'd like to learn more about, visit our website, agnowtv.com. And while you're there, you can check out past episodes, learn more about the folks that we've had on the show. And of course, you can also download our AgNow app. All of that's available at agnowtv.com. From our farm to your farm, have a great day. I'm Dave Deacon for AgNow.